hope that what I will talk will enlighten your hearts. I will talk to you about the mystery of Christ. Um, but I want you to really follow with me because I'm going to lay some foundations uh, so that you don't miss me later on when we talk. Uh, I'll go slow in the beginning because it's vital that we understand this. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. There are two mysteries spoken of in the scriptures. The mystery of God, which is Christ. And then the mystery of Christ, which is the church, his body. So I want you to see two things. There is the mystery of God, and we'll go through the scriptures. Mystery of God, which is Christ. And then you have the mystery of Christ, which is the church, which is his body. So these two concepts I want you to keep in your mind as we are going to relate them to you on two planes. It's because uh, I think that many of God's people don't fully understand this whole thing about the mystery. I know that in the previous school there was much said about Christ. And I, wanna, I know that Christ is the essence of what this whole school is all about. I believe that the point to which everything is going back to is Christ. In fact, the confluence of all factors within the entire universe is moving back under one head, who is Christ. So we have heard earlier on that we are, not, we are moving from theology to Christology, a Christ-centeredness in our approach. So in other words, if we want to study God, we study Christ. If we want to know more about God, we need to know more about Christ. And when Peter revealed through revelation who Christ was, uh, through the Father revealing, he said, but you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So I want you to see when you study God, you look at Christ. But when you look at Christ, you look at the Son. But when you look at the Son, you look at the Word. So the entrance point into God starts with the Word externally. You find the Son, you find the Christ, you find God. So there is a movement back to the point of departure. So I want us to see this afternoon as we, as we share a few thoughts around Paul. And I want to first uh, look at Paul's conception of Christ. What did, what did this apostle have that was sometimes difficult for even Peter to understand what he was proclaiming? So in Ephesians chapter 1, let's go there, Ephesians chapter 1, and we look at, and, the, and the, there's a trilogy of books. It's Ephesians, uh, Philippians, and Colossians. You must study these books together in order for us to get a great understanding of Christ. When you, when you look at Paul, when he was called, on the road of Damascus, Paul had his eyes enlightened. He began to, to write books like the book of Romans. Very doctrinal book, uh, but Paul in the book of Romans had a, a conception of Christ because Paul was in the beginnings of his, of his journey into Christ. He had a certain conception, a certain knowledge about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, Paul had a Jewishness about him, he had a time-relatedness about him. He had an earth perspective on Christ. He began to look at Christ from his Jewishness. He began to define this Christ from an earth-related, time-related perspective. He began to see this Christ might be the one that has been sent to come and release uh, us as the Jews from the captivity or the bondage and the imprisonment of the Romans. So he began to identify with the fleshly carnal side from where he has come from. And you remember later on in the, in the book of Philippians, Paul then counted all these things down. In other words, he put aside him being a Jew and he looked at a diff from a different perspective at himself. Now, I want us to see this as we journey into this thing. It's very important that you are awake. <laughs> are you awake? Okay. I want you to follow with me. So, so, I want us to see the conception of Paul about this Christ. Now, I want to say to you from the outset that there are two Christs mentioned in the Scripture. Now, I don't want you to you know, to, to, to look at me funny, uh, and, and we will prove it from Scripture, that there are two, two 
types of Christ that are mentioned in Scripture. Number one, Christ the head, who is the Son of God, and then Christ the body, who is the church. So you find two Christs. You find the corporate Christ. That is head and body. And I think many people have got a difficulty to understand that revelation right now. In many quarters, many places where we travel, we find people say, you're preaching, you're preaching heresy because they haven't got a, a conception about Christ in his body. Uh, they, they talk about only the Christ that was revealed through the prophetic writings. Now, when we talk about the mystery of Christ, the mystery with which Paul calls his gospel. Paul calls it my gospel. He says, this is my gospel that I am in chains for. The gospel that imprisoned me was not the gospel primarily that Paul brought about salvation that is in the Son of God, but Paul brought a revelation of the mystery of Christ, which is the body of Christ, the church. That is his gospel. So I want us to see this, two, this distinction here before we go further. So I want us to read. Can, come, come we, we read, and we're going to read through a lot of Scripture because it's very important. We have heard the previous session, Scripture is vital, so we need to look at the Scriptures all over again. And as we are going to read, I believe our eyes are going to be open. Scales are going to fall from our eyes. So let us see. Let me just get to it quickly. Ephesians 1 and we read from verse 9. Let's read from, from verse 9. Uh, come and read from verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. I want you to underline the words in Christ in the, in the whole of the book of Ephesians. You see that in Christ all the time. It says, he has blessed us in the spiritual realm with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him, that's in Christ, before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So in other words, we were chosen, elected, selected in Christ before time began. Then he says, in love, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ. In other words, the finality of why we have been chosen, why we have been selected, is that he wants us to be adopted as sons. And then he says, in accordance with the pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Then he says in verse 7, in him, that's in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ. So the mystery of his will is purposed in Christ. To be put in effect, that is the word dispensation, to be put in effect. Who's got the King James? It talks about the dispensation. So it says to be put in effect, verse, verse 10, when the times will have reached their fulfillment to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. In other words, God wants all things to come back to, together to the point of its departure the point from which it moved away, God is busy maneuvering everything right back to the spiritual axis from which it has moved away. In other words, the hub out from which everything flows is Christ. The problem with the church, if you look at, 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 the, at the, the, the epistle of Ephesians, you'll find that Paul, in the first chapter, he sings a long song of praise about all the cardinal doctrines that you find in the church. He speaks about us being selected, our calling, our adoption, our redemption, our forgiveness. He talks about all these different cardinal doctrines. But the problem of the church is that we have zeroed in onto one or two of these doctrines and built our denomination around it. Instead of seeing the hub out from which these doctrines flow. In fact, God wants to bring us back doctrinally for us to understand that our doctrine is Christ. That you find in, 
in uh, the first epistle of John, uh, verse 9. He says, don't run ahead. He says uh, that, we, that we need to understand that our doctrine or our teaching is the doctrine of Christ. He says that he who has the doctrine has both the Father and the Son. He who hasn't got the doctrine hasn't got the Father and do not have the Son. I mean, that's very important for us for this time in which we live. We need to be very careful that in this final days, uh, as we're seeing the culmination of all the things in the earth, that the finality of everything that we are maneuvering our faith toward is the position called Christ. Say Christ. So now it's very important then for us to understand this doctrine, and we need to understand this mystery. What is this mystery all about? When the Bible talks about a mystery in a biblical sense, the Bible doesn't talk about some secret that God doesn't want us to find out about. The word mystery, mysterion, comes from the verb muo, M-U-O, which literally means to shut your mouth or to keep your mouth quiet. In other words, you don't speak. You don't say anything. Now, the mystery I am talking about is that which God kept his mouth shut about in dispensations of time and then only revealed it in a particular kairos. In other words, God has kept certain things quiet, shut, hidden until the time frame was right for them to be revealed. And then God opened up his mouth. Now, in times past, God opened up his mouth in parables, in types, in symbolic language, in divine cameos. God spoke in many ways and in very fragmented ways through the prophets in times past. That's what Hebrews 1 says. In other words, God did speak. God spoke through the prophets to the forefathers, fragmented ways. Here a little, there a little. Uh, here a line, there a line. So you had to weave all the truths together because God's revelation builds one on top of the other. God be gives the first mention of a principle, then God brings the comparative mention. Then God gives the full mention of a principle. So in other words, you cannot establish doctrine on one verse of Scripture. So you've got to look at Scripture, how Scripture enlarge upon itself. In other words, progressive revelation flows through the entire canon of God's word. So you can't build your case on one verse. You've got to look at the entirety of the canon and you've got to then find out what is God saying about that subject and then come to certain conclusions. So that's what I want us to do this afternoon. I want us to look at scripture differently. I want us to investigate this afternoon and we want to get to the mystery. What is the mystery? We know Christ in you, the hope of glory that Gentile and Jew come together in one body, that, the, that the, the dividing wall of hostility has been broken down between Jew and Gentile, and now there is the fellowship of the body. It's one body, one new man, that you have Jew, Gentile, no male, no female, no bond, no free, in one body, made up with Christ Jesus, the head, and the many members of the church, forming the corporate body of Christ in the earth. That's the, the mystery. Now, all of us know about this mystery, but we need to delve a little bit deeper into this mystery to really understand the unfolding thereof. So are you ready? Are you ready for the journey? Okay. So now, <clears throat> let us go, let's go to, let's go back to this verse. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. And then he says, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together, what is the purpose? What's the ultimate that God is after? He wants to bring all things in both heaven and earth together under one head, even Christ, not under the UN, not under our government, not under denominational governments. God wants to bring all things back under one head who is Christ. And for that to happen, God must shake things in heaven and God must shake things in the earth. Though there's a shaking going on because God wants 
only one principle to remain, and that is Christ. Every other thing that does not line up with God's intent will be shaken and will be removed. So what is God saying? He wants to bring things in heaven and things in the earth together under one head, even Christ. So I want you to see this movement. There is a movement. There is a movement out of being time-related into a movement back to become eternal. So God wants us to become eternal in our perspective. God wants us to be positioned in the eternity of time. Because he says here that when the times will have reached their fulfillment, the word times the word kairoi or kairosis. In other words, a kairos is not chronological time that is measured in terms of seconds and moments and hours and days and months and decades and millennium. No, a kairos is a different type of time that I believe God is wanting to unveil certain stuff to the church. I believe that we are in a kairos moment right now an opportune moment, a moment when the heavens are opened, a moment when we can pluck things out of heaven, that the revelation is flowing. It's a decisive point in time. It's a time that is, has got certain constituted events connected to it. Now, these are the times that the church must lay a hold of and we must do the governmental work of God to make sure that the times reach pleroma or fullness. The time has come to fullness, but the times must reach their fullness in Christ. Now, for that to happen, something in the earth must be engaged. There must be a priest in the earth that knows how to connect heaven with earth. Now, I see in many churches that the priesthood is going back to the Levitical order, where people set up a man as a priest and they must answer to him. You know, pastor has become the priest. But we are priests. All of us are priests, right? So there's an order of priesthood, which is the Melchizedek order. Whenever you find Melchizedek, you find heaven and earth connections. When Abraham met Melchizedek the very first time, and he bended his knee, and he gave Melchizedek a tithe, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. And the Bible says, Melchizedek said these words, Blessed art thou, uh, Abram of God most high, El Elyon, the God of heaven and earth. Blessed be Abram by the God that possesses heaven and earth. So whenever Melchizedek comes, whenever a type of priesthood is in the earth that is again operating in the understanding of the Melchizedek order that we have heard earlier about. It's the king-priest order. It is that order that stands in the power of an endless life. He says that this priest did not have a father or mother, did not have genealogy, had no beginning of days, no end of life, but had its power in an endless life. I mean, in other words, when I talk about this priesthood, I'm talking about a priesthood that stands in eternity. A priesthood that knows how to operate two realms simultaneously. A priesthood that knows how to connect heaven with earth. How to bring both realms together in one. And the only way that that realms can be connected together is it must find itself in a position called Christ. God wants both realms to converge onto one point, one point of converging, Christ. The heavens and the earth must be reconnected only in Christ. Now it's very important for us then to understand that where we are going to, the church is maneuvering to a preferred position, an ancient position that is locked up in God's heart, which is called Christ. It's that position where everything will be determined by the headship of Jesus Christ. And everything will come back under not just the headship of Jesus Christ, but also the body that is connected to the head. The heavens contain the head, but the earth contains the body. So we have one new man. The one new man principle is that is going to have and contain all things. Everything is gathering toward that point. So there's a great momentum in the earth. 
for the church to maneuver to the preferred position of God. Come on, are you so quiet? You still with me? Okay, I want you to follow. Now Paul talks, I want us to look at this verse. Very interesting. Very interesting verse. I want you to go to Colossians 2 and verse 2 very quickly with me. Told you we're going to read some scripture here. These are vital things that we need to understand as we journey in the Lord. Paul writes and he says in verse 2 of Colossians chapter 2, My purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding. What is Paul saying? He's saying that you must have the ability to understand concepts and see relationships between them. I want you to have complete understanding. In order, why must you have complete understanding? In order that they may know. The word is epic gnosis. It's not gnosis. It's not just having a knowledge that we acquired through much study. It's not a knowledge you get by going to Bible school. It's not a knowledge you get by... Uh, by by uh, studying the scriptures. It is a knowledge that comes by revelation. It is a knowledge that comes by spiritual interaction. It is a knowledge that God wants the church to have that, that they did not previously had. Like Paul said, it pleased God the Father to have his son revealed in me. That is Galatians 1 verse 15. So God wants his son to be revealed not to us, but in us. It's not objective, it is subjective. God wants the revelation of the Son to spring up on the inside of the heart. It is epic gnosis knowledge. It is a knowledge that comes directly out from the heart of the Spirit into your spirit. When that knowledge comes, when epic gnosis knowledge comes, it begins to reconstruct the inside of your mind and the inside of your heart, and it begins to go into every crevice where there's an in erroneous position about Christ within your heart and in your mind. It begins to seek out all the areas where we are in, not in alignment with God, that's the type of knowledge I'm talking about. Paul is saying, I want you to have complete understanding in order that you may know the mystery of God. Now, how will this mystery come? The knowledge of it comes, not casually. It doesn't come by much study. It doesn't come by just going to Bible school. It comes by having been positioned correctly. It comes by upholding a certain position in the Lord. It comes by repositioning your spirit man. It comes by actively engaging scripture to have your noose renewed, to have the mind renewed. In other words, there must be no conformity to the patterns of the earth. There must be no conformity to the patterns of this world, but there must be a transformation that comes by the renewing of the mind. God wants a renewed mindset, and when the mind is renewed, the eyes are enlightened. No wonder Paul begins to write in Ephesians 1.17, he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. An enlightened heart or the eyes of your heart doesn't speak of the physical eyes. It speaks about a deeper revelation, a deeper understanding that comes via rhema knowledge that is based on the logos, that comes into the structure of your mind, that begins to reconstruct your mindset, that begins to help you to have spiritual sight. Many of God's people can't see. They like the man in John chapter 9, nine they born blind. Blind from birth. Blind from the moment they got spiritual birth. Their eyes were never, never, uh, sight was never restored to them until you can wash in what pool? The apostolic pool. Go to the pool of Siloam that by interpretation means sent. 
go and wash, dip, uh, nip toe, and continue to wash. It's a continuing action of washing. You dip yourself underneath. You don't come up. You dip underneath until you are clean and until your sight is restored. It's very important that we come to these things all the time, that we begin to see a clarity of vision. Now, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers lest they can see. Sight has got to do with the mind. If the mind is blinded, the eyes of the spirit can't see. How will you begin to see is when you work on your mind, on your news, through a process of repentance. Repentance simply means I'm going to begin to change my way of thought. That is, I'm going to shift a paradigm. I'm going to not think the way that I formerly did in my old denomination, in my old order in which I stood. I want to shed off some skin. I'm going through a process of mental renovation, of spiritual metamorphosis. I want to begin to see. Many of God's people can't see. That's the problem. Prophets want to enlighten you to begin to see the picture. What is the picture? The picture is Christ, nothing else. There is nothing else we can bring to you out of the scriptures. We must convey, exegete, bring out of the bosom of the Father. We need to bring Christ, nothing else. So the ultimate determining factor in the end times will be to see whether a ministry can relate to you the doctrine of Christ. That's the ultimate. Nothing else. There's no, nothing else on the agenda of God right now. It is Christ. Only Christ. Christ and his kingdom. That's the subject matter of the mystery. The mystery is it's about Christ, right? Now, let's see this. Let's just read it. That they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. There it is. It says, it talks about the mystery of God, namely Christ. So Christ then is the mystery of God. Then he says, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Where are the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? Hidden in Christ, which is the mystery of God. So this knowledge, this complete knowledge is not sense-based knowledge. It's knowledge coming directly from the heart of God as you hear the word being administered to you. As the word comes, it illuminates the heart as that bright shining light. It's a voice speaking to you and that voice conveys light. In him was life and that life was the light of men. That light shone in the darkness. There are dark corridors that is hidden in our hearts and in our minds that needs to be illuminated by this word that comes when Christ is broken open. There's an illumination, a light that begins to emit the standards of the eternal dimensions. The timeless zone is being emitted as the standards of God's throne. It opens up a new reality and we begin to see different. I'm telling you, when you begin to see Christ, you will begin to cry like Paul, for me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. I've counted all things but dung for the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In fact, I have put it aside, all my credentials, everything that I am, I counted all but dung that I may know Christ. And the power of his resurrection. Share in the fellowship of his sufferings. Be made conformable to his death. I mean, how will a man talk like that? I want to share in the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. I want to make up in my body which lacks in suffering in Christ's physical body for the sake of the church. This man talks like this. He saw something. Something happened on the, on the road to Damascus. Now, I believe that all of us must have this type of revelation of Jesus Christ, and we need to have this revelation of the Christ. All of us. It will begin to 
change something. You will, be, you will come to the place in your life where you are willing to die for what you believe. Paul says, I'm in chains. And I write to you about this mystery. I'm in chains. But I'm not in chains within my spirit. I'm in chains in my flesh. Now listen carefully. Let me say this to you. Persecution is going to come on the earth. Now this is not to instill fear in the body of Christ. But I want you to understand that one of the teachings that's going to become vital in this time is this thing about how to share in the fellowship of his sufferings. He didn't suffer for himself. He suffered for the people. And we must enter into his sufferings. How do we do that? That's a teaching for another time. But we need to begin to understand these things, explore these things, because I realize that as we are going to maneuver to the finality of things, testing is going to come. People are going to sell out because they're not rooted, not built. They're not growing up into the head who is Christ. Okay? Now, he says something here that is very important. Let's go back to Philippians, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 10, 9 and 10. Let's just go back there quickly. He's saying something that is vital there. He says the following. He purposed in Christ to be put in effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. So the words to be put into effect, that is one word, which is the word dispensation. I don't know if you have King James Version. Uh, it talks about the dispensation, right? It talks about the dispensation. It talks about, it's another word, it calls, it's, it's, got, it's got to do with the administration of something, to administrate something. So the word administration or dispensation is the Greek word oikonomia. Oikonomia. Comes from two words, oikos, which is household, or the household doesn't speak about the house physically, but the people in the house, or it also speaks about a lineage. It speaks about a generation. It speaks about a man and all of his possessions. Oikos, household. And it comes from another word added to that, nomos, is the word law. So when we talk about dispensation, when we talk about administration, it is like a man becoming a steward over a household. And he stewards the household based on what is in the house. So when we talk about dispensation, we talk about the arrangement or the ordering of the household or the law that comes out from the house, or the orderly arrangement of things as they exist within the house, and how that orderly arrangement is disposed of out from the household. Are you guys still with me? Okay. I want you to follow me. Now, this word nomos comes from the root nemo. It means to deal out, to measure out, to distribute, to apportion, or to dispense. So, the household becomes the dispensary of God. Listen carefully. The household of faith becomes the great dispensary of God. Like you would go to a pharmacist, you take the prescription, and you get medicine dispensed to you from the dispensary. So a household, the household of faith that, we have, that, that, that the apostles and the prophets have spoke about, spoken about that is now established as the medium through which the relational model of father and son can be perpetuated so that the principles of succession can then be administrated. The household is that place where the grace of God in all its fullness and this mystery can be dispensed from. Listen carefully. The mystery of Christ will only be dispensed from a household. Not a church where there's membership. I want you to understand where God is maneuvering the church to. There will be a place of no maneuvering anymore. It will either be in the one or in the other thing. 
So there's additions coming all the time to what we are teaching. So in the administration of the house, there is a father and sons. So it is only within the concept or the arrangement of the house. What is the law of the house? The law of the house is the internal arrangement of fathering and sonship. Out of that arrangement will flow the unfolding of the mystery. The dispensing thereof unto other people will come out from the house full of sons. So sonship then very, very important. If you haven't shifted yet to the model of sonship and fathering, it's time for you to do it now. Don't argue about it, just jump. Jump ship if you need to. Wave the old order goodbye if you need to. But it's time for you to jump and cross over. Say cross over. There's no more time. There isn't time. Because we, we can see futuristically. And we can see what's on the horizon coming. And we are declaring to you, it's time to jump ship. Don't dilly-dally and halt between two opinions. Because God is maneuvering the church to this one point. Everything must be under one head. Even Christ. Even Christ. We get persecuted for it. Paul gave his life for it. Paul saw something. All the brethren. By the time Paul wrote the book of Philippians, he was 20 years already an apostle in the Lord. 20 years. And after 20 years, Paul said, I count the things that I see to myself as, as stuff that I materially have gained. My reputation, all the stuff, I counted dung. I counted nothing that I may gain Christ. In other words, Paul's conception, as Paul's conception about Christ began to enlarge upon him, and Paul, first of all, argued from his Jewishness. He argued about a physical kingdom. He argued about a Jewish Messiah that will come in, in Jewish flesh. He argued from that point. But as Paul get, got a greater revelation, a greater expanding conception about the eternal, the cosmic, the ascended Christ, the, not just the crucified Christ, not just the historical Christ, because Paul never knew Jesus after the flesh. But he had, he had this ascended uh, understanding about this cosmic arrangement. And as Paul's uh, uh, revelation and conception about this Christ enlarged upon the apostle, guess what began to happen to him? He began to become delivered from an earth and time-related perspective about eternal things. He was emancipated from his Jewishness. He was, he was delivered. Now you see, true deliverance is not us driving out some little devils, but it's got to do with a conception, a perception of the eternal, and begin to bring that into the arrangement of your life. And when you begin to see it, you get delivered. Deliverance is instantaneous when you can see it. If you can conceive of it, if you can understand it, when your conception grows, then you begin to write things like this. In Christ, there's no more male nor female. There's no Jew, there's no Gentile. Where did Paul come on that? Paul first argued in the book of Romans about his Jewishness, his Jewish brothers. Now Paul's conception is enlarged about the resurrected, ascended, uh, cosmic Christ, the eternal Christ. When he had that revelation hit him inside of him, that epic gnosis knowledge hit him in his spirit, Paul got rearranged. Paul got now diverted from his Jewishness and he began to write things like, I am no longer alive. Uh, I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live the life that I live. I live now by the faith in the Son of God. Why would Paul write things like this? For me to live is Christ. He made, he made living coextensive with Christ. He wasn't saying for me to live is having and holding a position in Christ. 
or having some theological dogmas about Christ. He said, Christ is life. Look at, look at how he puts it. He says, Christ is life. My life is Christ. In other words, I need to be deleted so that Christ can resurrect inside of me. That, that when, when I live in my flesh, it's not me, the old Paul living, but it's Christ living his life through me. I mean, wow, that's goodness me. And I, when I begin to study this man and I look deeper into the structure of his thinking, I begin to say, God, I want that. I want that stuff, Lord. I don't know about you. How hungry are you? How hungry are you? Now, in Scripture, there are two different bodies of Christ. Listen carefully. What are the distinctions, firstly? One of the bodies mentioned in the, is the physical, fleshly body in which the Son of God became incarnate. Please don't say I'm teaching heresy. I want you to see this thing, and I'm going to give you a lot of Scripture to prove it. Okay? Two bodies. The physical body in which the Son of God became incarnate. First Peter 2 verse 24. Who bear, his, who bear, who, who in his own body bear our sins upon the tree that we having died unto sins might live unto righteousness. Look at this verse. Who has in his own body bear our sins in his body. That body there refers to Christ the Son. Are you guys with me? Christ the Son. Okay? Look at Acts 3.19. Repent then that he may send you the Christ, even Jesus. Very carefully he shows you this Christ he's talking about is not the body of Christ, but he talks about Christ, even Jesus. Okay? Then in Luke 22 verse 19, he says, This is my body in the table of the Lord, which is given for you. Then in Matthew 27, I want to just read these verses because it's important. Matthew 27 verses 57 to 58. As evening approached, this is after Jesus died on the cross, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus, going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Now, that body there, the physical body that Jesus had, right, or had, that body was Christ, okay? Now, we're not talking about that body being the mystery, the mystery that Paul is talking about. We're talking about that body was canonized in Scripture. The prophets spoke about that body of Jesus in his incarnation. It was here a little, there a little. The prophets spoke about it in fragmentary ways. And so uh, Jesus became incarnate within this fleshly body. Now, that's the first body that the Bible is referring to. So I want us to see that. Now, the other body of Christ is the church, which is his body. That you find in Ephesians 1, verses 22 to 23. And having and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body. Can you see that? There's two bodies. There's the body of Jesus, the head, incarnate in flesh. And there is the many-membered body of Christ that is consisting out of every individual that is part of the great composite of the body within all the nations. That is the mystical body we are talking about. In fact, when the Bible talks about the Jesus being the head, the Bible never says that Jesus is, uh, the Bible never says, the Bible says that the church is the body of Christ. The Bible never says that the church is the body of Jesus. Right? The church is not the body of Jesus. The church is the body of Christ. So there's two things you, you need to see here. This is vital. The church is not the body of Jesus. The church is the body of Christ. Right? Jesus, the Christ, had his own body in the incarnation so that the work of atonement could be affected. 
And out of atonement, in resurrection and ascension, he gave his spirit and brought forth his body in the earth that is now occupied by the Christ. So Christ in you, the hope of glory. Okay, can you see the two bodies? There's the physical body, Jesus, and there is the spiritual body, which is the Christ who is the church, the many-membered body of Christ. So keep, keep with me here, trying to lay this foundation here. The church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. In other words, the church body, the many-membered body, is the completion of him. It's the fullness of him, right? So where is he now? He is in his body, in the many-membered body. Now, when we talk about the administration of grace or the administration of this mystery, it's a dispensing of the life of God out from the household that now be, us becoming a partaker of this Christ through the dispensing agency, which is the church or the household of God. As the word of God is administered, more of his life is imparted to the ones that, that are the recipients thereof. So there's a transferring of life that takes place through the gospel, through the word of God. There's a transference, not just an, an illumination, but also a transference of life because there is a parceling out of himself unto the church to constitute the church, the body of Christ. We got that? Okay. This body is only mentioned in Paul's epistles. The church, which is his body, is only mentioned in Paul's epistles. You do not find this mentioned in any part of the Bible. In fact, the only metaphor that is never mentioned in the Old Testament is the metaphor about the church being the body of Christ. You will find all the other metaphors that points to the Christ, the head, in the Old Testament. But Christ in his body is never mentioned once in the Old Testament. You will not find it as a revelation in the Old Testament. Why? Because God kept his mouth shut until Paul came on the scene. God kept that revelation for generations. He kept it in his heart. In fact, the scripture says that this mystery was not hidden in the scriptures. It was hidden in God. I'll show it to you. So where was the mystery kept? It was kept in the father heart of God until the times should come to its fulfillment. So that in a particular kairos, God could now reveal this to our generation. It was held in God's heart. It was not in metaphoric principle. It was not locked up in symbolic language. It was not locked up in us studying the tabernacle. It's got to do with the new revelation which Paul calls his gospel. I don't want you to miss me. I want you to see this thing. Because many of God's people are confused when they read about Christ in the scriptures. Because the Bible talks about Jesus then he talks about Jesus Christ. Then he talks about Christ Jesus. Then he talks about Christ on his own. So if you don't read it carefully, you might read something wrong in it. So you need to understand what Paul is talking about. This is vital for us. There are then also two Christs in view in the New Testament. Not just two bodies, but two Christs. Now, I, I don't want to, to sound heretical here. I want, I want you to see it in the context of what we are saying, okay? There's actually one Christ, the Christ, consisting of head and, and, and body. But I want us to see the scriptures here. We have, first of all, the personal Christ. That's Jesus. That which the prophets foretold. 
they foretold about Jesus the Christ that was born in Bethlehem, right? That they foretold. That came to us in fragmented portions. All through the canon of Scripture, they spoke in times past through the prophets to the forefathers about this Messiah. When they spoke about this Messiah, there was a reference to him being the head, him being the Christ, the Jesus Christ, right? So let's just read a few scriptures. Matthew 16, 16, Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. There is a reference to the singular Christ, the singular son, if you can see that. Now, in Matthew 16, Christ is revealed as the Son of God. He says, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Singular, not the sons of God. Now, the reason why he became the Son of God, manifested in flesh, was to bring us, the corporate Son, into being. It's part of the mystery. So sonship then can only be revealed by the Father. Sons can only be revealed by Father. At his baptism, Jesus was revealed. When he stood in the waters of baptism, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Fathers reveal sons. Sons is known by their fathers. Whose son is this? He is David, the son of Jesse. He is Jesus, the Son of God. Sons are known by their fathers. If you want to identify a son, study his father. If you want to know how a son will behave, look at the genealogical records of the father. See how the father acted. The son will act likewise. Unless a son, like this little boy, Josiah, went over his father's generation and went to go look for models and patterns outside of his own father, and he talked about my father David. Because in his own father, he could not find a model worthy to be followed. So he went over his father's generation, and he went right back to David, and he called David his father. So a son is known by his father. That's what we call adoption. Adoption, right? He adopted a father. He adopted David's model, even though his own father was, I think, uh, Asa or Manasseh. You guys still with me? Okay. Now, Colossians 1.13, another verse quickly. For he, God, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of of the son he loves. Then it opens up in Colossians 1, 15. He, the son he loves, is the image of the invisible God. This Christ, the head, is the very image of the invisible God. In verse 18, he, that's Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church. There it says it to us, that the head is Jesus of the body which is the church. The church is his body, but it's the body of Christ, not the body of Jesus. Jesus has his own body. Right? Now, verse 19 of Colossians 1. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Wow. All the fullness of God indwelt this Christ the head. Hebrews 1.13 says, being the brightness of glory and the express image of his person. Jesus Christ, the express image of God's person. Express image, character or character, literally means an impression, impressed character. It means a distinctive marked, impressed upon a thing that makes it different from anything else. The image. Jesus is the express image of the Father, of God. Right? Now, being the express image of his person, this word person, hypostasis, hippo, two words, hippo, to be under, under, and histomai, 
to stand, meaning to stand underneath something. He is the express image of his person. The word person is to stand under, that under which Christ stood, the foundation that kept him up, that made the Father visible in the earth. He, he stood on something, right? That which stands underneath or the substructure or the foundation which, which keeps things up. So Christ, being the Son of God, bears the exact impress of the divine nature and the character of the Father. So that which stands under or give expression to the substance of the Son is the Father, but the Son visibly reveals Him. Now I want you to go with me quickly to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. We're going somewhere. How much time we have? He talks here, he gives us a picture of marriage. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. There he says it again. Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their own husbands in everything. Husband loves your wife just as Christ loved the church. You see, he's making comparisons here. He's comparing He's taking a physical reality and he turns it into a spiritual principle. He talks about a husband and a wife and their love for one another and how they are one and how the one must obey the other one and how the one must love the other one. And he says, just as that, the church is in a relationship with Christ. So he goes further and he says, uh, verse, let's just see, verse uh, 27, verse 26, to make her, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish, but holy and blameless. In the same way, there he says it, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Now he says, this is a profound mystery. But I am not talking. I'm, I'm, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and his wife must respect her husband. Paul throws in there, he says, just as a husband and a wife becomes one flesh, the husband leaving his father and mother and cleave to his, hus to, to his wife, they become one flesh, so the church, the body of Christ, and the head will be one. One flesh. They that are joined unto the Lord is one spirit with Him. So we are eternally one with the head, one body, many members, one new man in the earth. I believe the answers for the earth's problems is that every person of culture must migrate to this position called Christ. There you will have no more Women's liberation talks. You will have no more talks about male and femaleness. You will have no more cultural distinctions. You will have no more race distinctions because we are all one in Christ. The moment you step into Christ, you lose all sorts of things. Now, when you, when you maneuver into Christ and your eyes are enlightened, you begin to see the way Paul did. You don't see color. There's no color distinctions in Christ. The Bible says that we have been all baptized by one spirit into one body. There's a baptism that we have undergone. We've been baptized by one spirit.